Hi, and welcome to the Wires discussion on um, you know, economic growth, skilling of India, which is you know, a pet project of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Um, India's demographic dividend has long been cited as an advantage uh, for our country, but lately a number of commentators and economic experts are also referring it to as a demographic time bomb. Uh, where you know, at any uh, given point in the year, we have 12 million people who are trying to enter the workforce, but only creating 4 million, 5 million jobs, depending on uh, which estimate you go by. And uh, some of this is, of course, is because the manufacturing sector has sort of not created the jobs we had expected. The organized services sector. In, in recent years, years, much less than 4 million, actually. Correct. No, that's true. Uh, I mean, 2009, 2010 was probably uh, the peak of job created. And, and you know India's services sector, the organized services sector at least, has also seen uh, you know layoffs in the last one year as uh, growth sort of slows down. So today we have with us uh, Mr. Janet Krishna, who is the chief operating officer officer of the National Skills Development Corporation. So the organization underneath underneath the ministry ministry that's trying to skill India's youth and hopefully uh, you know guide them towards a better future with uh, greater opportunity. So I mean. Uh, could could you start us off Jay, by sort of talking about this? Is it a time bomb, you know? And is the Skill India project working? See, the demographics of our country very clearly. It's like a double-edged sword. You know, if you skill people well, if you create livelihood options, uh, very clearly you can leverage a demographic dividend. If you don't, then it could become a demographic disaster. So that's, uh, I mean, uh, that's 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 a, that's a fact, you know. Uh, this skills as an area, area has been ignored by the country for a very, very long time. And uh, the, the seriousness started uh, uh, in 2007, 2008 kind of a time frame when the new policy uh, of skill development came into being. And then subsequently by the current government when it set up a new ministry for skill development and entrepreneurship, I think. So we started pretty late, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, the countries in the Western world, they've had a three, four decade journey, you know, before they could stabilize their skill story. You know, uh, we started late, wasted uh, several, almost six decades after independence, we wasted. And uh, now we have started and uh, and we don't have the luxury of waiting for another three, four div uh, decades because that uh, window of uh, opportunity that the demographic dividend presents for the country is not unlimited. If we don't put our acts together, uh, and start uh, delivering results, then then uh, I think the country will pay a very uh, heavy price. But but the good story is a lot of positive things are happening, have started happening, and the initial results are uh, pretty encouraging. But you know uh, this is a huge space. Uh, you know as I always say, the largest human resource development exercise ever even attempted by any country in the history of mankind. So the more you do, the more seems to remain to be done. How do you, uh, Jen, characterize? The performance of uh, this Prime Minister's uh, flagship program called uh, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is last year uh, allocated uh, 1500 crores uh, for skilling people uh, uh, entering the job market, for youth entering the job market. Now, there is a report uh, commissioned by the government which says that, that its performance has uh, been much below par. It says about 8.5 percent of the people skilled have actually got jobs. Now, how would you respond to that? See, this uh, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana is country's answer to the issue that who pays for skilling? Uh, for people who are from the bottom of the pyramid, uh, many of them don't know where the next meal will come from. How would they pay a fee if it is based on a cost plus recovery basis or based on market forces, you know? Mm -hmm. So, it's country's answer to that, uh, that, you know, skilling is for free. In the in the year 2000, let's say, uh, talk about 15, 16. You know, uh, we enrolled all close to 20 lakh people there. You know, and uh, uh, last year, I will not like to uh, quote the figure. When you say you enrolled 20 lakh people for skilling, for skilling under the scheme, under, under the, the scheme, scheme. yeah, okay. and uh, almost 14, 15 lakh people, uh, you know, uh, were certified. They so were you're doing for about two, two million, one and a half to two million a year uh, enrolling. See, uh, uh, under Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, though this in this financial year, see, last year was a year when we took stock, uh, took up, took a lot of corrective steps, a lot of improvements were brought about. So last year's number under the, under the PMKY were down vis a vis year before last. But this year, again, the uh, you know, everything is, uh, uh, you know, up uh, is hunky dory, uh, uh, new systems have been put in place mm -hmm. and things will improve. I'll just tell you, see, you, you talked about this figure. See, uh, uh, the employment and self, uh, uh, the wage employment as well as the self-employment figures. Uh, 
for uh, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana so far has been about uh, close to 20 percent, you know. But the actual data is more because in the earlier scheme, there was no incentive for training providers to even record this data, you know, kind of a thing. Okay. So this year, the, among other changes that we have made, what we have done, the last 20 percent of the payment of the training partners would come uh, from the government, from the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship through NSDC. Only when the people, uh, there, there's a documentary evidence of uh, 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 employment, wage or self-employment having happened, you know. So this is one change we have made. Yes, there were some glitches, some uh, inadequacies in the earlier schemes. I'll tell you, earlier the scheme could have been done out of practically any training center kind of a thing in the country. So this year what we have done. So there was no quality monitoring. Well, monitoring was there, but was was not adequate. Not adequate. Okay. Yeah. So, so for example, uh, year before last, we did uh, this 20 lakh people. When we talked about, they 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 were enrolled in about 12,500 centers. You know, this year we uh, we have uh, reduced the number. This year, the, uh, almost 4,000 centers that we have, yeah. and they go through a huge filtration uh, level. In the sense, our sector skill councils they prescribe that for the job roles that the training providers have interest in, what kind of equipment is required, what kind of classrooms are required, the entire lab requirement everything is there and then every applicant training partner has to apply for a center level affiliation you know mm -hmm. and all details on of the center are self populated on a portal that we have mm -hmm. then some disc, desk research happens analysis happens and then a field visit happens mm -hmm. by NSDC through uh, an outsource arrangement through the Co quality council of India mm -hmm. then only when the center is found to meet the requirements then we give them different uh, uh, grades like uh, three star, four star, five star, mm -hmm. and only uh, so far we have been giving uh, targets only under the PMKY to the to the to the centers which have four star or five star rating. You know, mm -hmm. so a lot of quality improvement has happened. Placement link. So you're saying that through all these processes, you're hoping that the number of people skilled uh, getting jobs will be more uh, going forward. Uh, so the, the quality of skills delivery will improve. Uh, and the, the jobs, the job connect, the market connect would improve. For example, we have sector skill councils. We have, we, we said that let them also do the job of demand aggregation. That where do the demands uh, come from, you know. Mm. So, so far, just a beginning. In last few months itself, they have been able to aggregate almost 8 lakh jobs. You know, uh, actual uh, jobs, actual jobs, which is at the company level, location level, skill level, what role and what level of hierarchy that you're job saying is. this is real. This, this is real. Eight lakhs will be delivered. Uh, eight lakh job aggregation has happened. Now the next challenge is how do we connect these jobs with the training partners so that you know, uh, you know uh, what what they offer. And is. these jobs are in which sectors generally? Construction. Uh, they, they are into all construction, IT, retail, hospitality, healthcare, uh, agriculture, whole lot of uh, areas put together. Mm -hmm. You know we have. 40 sector skill councils, not everybody has done, but almost uh, uh, anywhere between 12 to 15 sector skill councils have aggregated these uh, 8 lakh jobs. And uh, this is just the beginning of the process, you know. So I think uh, that is happening. Plus, uh, earlier, most of the training in PMKY used to be there at the uh, NSQF level 1 and 2, just the entry level. We have pegged that up to level 3 and 4 this time. Yeah. Earlier, we used to stop at uh, giving them the qualification packs, you know. Uh, and the national occupation standards. And now then we started make, making the model curriculum. And not only that, we gave a book, complete book for each job role. You know, you know that kind of handholding is being done. The training of trainers has been made compulsory. You can't start a center unless that people are trained by the sector skill council centrally in a ten-day uh, long program. You, you you know. These processes have been put in place. In the last, uh, in the last few months, I would say in last uh, uh, seven eight months, these processes have been played, uh, put in place. And uh, but the big big data is which you yourself told me earlier, uh, in our earlier interaction, uh, that of the total employed uh, or employable uh, pool in India, which is about four eighty or five hundred million, right? Uh, the labor force size is almost uh, estimated to be anywhere between 48 crore to 51 yeah, crore. Yeah, say okay, f take, take it as 480 million, right? Yeah. Of that, you told me that just about 5% of that has formal skills. Yeah, I mean, again, we don't have data, but general, in fact, less than 5%, just about 4% people are formally skilled. Uh, in the so, sense so, so you're saying that 95% do not have... Form, not formally skilled. They are not formally skilled. So for them, we have rolled out another program called recognition of prior learning. That somebody, for example, a silk weaver in Varanasi, you know, or uh, a chicken curry worker in Lucknow, you know, or a pool curry worker in uh, uh, artisan in Punjab, you know. So these are people who have the skills, but they don't have a formal certification. So what we do, we do a quick assessment and a snap survey as to find out what the gaps are 
uh, they have some skills, but what are the gaps? For example, a silk weaver of Varanasi, they may know the core weaving very well, but what they may not be very good at uh, design skills, they may not be very good at yarn dyeing skills. So you they connect them with those skills. Connects, you know. So we give them an incremental training of that and then give them the certification for the entire job role, you know. So I think these kind of things, but you know, uh, it's, a, it's a huge task, a gigantic task. You know, if I start, if I claim that everything is hunky-dory, everything is in place, perhaps not. But you know, we are all gearing up to, uh, to, to make uh, things happen, you know. Just to interject here, what is, we've seen, we, earlier also we spoke about the difference between fee-based skilling, you know, where uh, if a person wants to get, you know, uh, the uh, pass course or the certification, he has to pay for it. Or, you know, we have a number of government programs, the most recent one, of course, the PMKY, where the government subsidizes and, uh, you know, gives NSDC a certain amount of money. And then we've seen that this sort of subsidized skilling has not worked in the past, too. I mean, uh, the Modi government's uh, uh, PMKY is just now in 2013, but we had the STAR program, for instance, 2013. We had SIDS back way back in 2007. And... Uh, you know, there's a lot of data to show that that hasn't worked out as well. So why why does fee-based skilling, where the person has to pay for it, why does that automatically encourage, why does it result in higher placements, why does it result in higher quality uh, skilling and education in the first place when, I mean, it's still being compensated, right? No one is doing this for free. It just depends whether the person pays for it or whether the government is subsidizing it. Yeah, I think I think in the fee, in the fee-based uh, training, the see the coefficient of seriousness <laughs> increase uh, many fold. You know, uh, from the training partners, from the trainers, and from students themselves. You know, if you if 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 something is g given to you for free, you don't value it as much as if you have, if you have saved or your parents have saved and paid for it uh, for it. You know, and therefore, you know, in our fee-based uh, training, the placement uh, percentage has been of and not one year's data since inception of NSDC. Our experience has been almost 50% of the fee-based people have been have got uh, wage employment or are self-employed, you know, kind of thing. So, so, so definitely, I mean, uh, uh, you know, and and to my mind, it's my personal uh, uh, view may not necessarily be that of the ministry, but I think uh, uh, we we have to take the fee-based uh, training uh, more seriously, and 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 you know, have prior corporate connects before the batches start. There's several, even our current training partners. If not all of them, at least a few of them have very good industry connects and you know they enroll students, they mobilize students for a course only based on cert definite placement uh, assurances from corporates uh, which, are, which are documented and, and, and then people also when they come there they know that they're going to get a job and unless a person is useless, most of the people who pass out they get a job with that corporate for which the batch is being run. I think the seriousness goes up many fold, the quality of delivery improves and uh, and, and so on and so this forth. One, I'll, yeah. uh, one more I think, one, uh, you know, let's look at states like Maharashtra and Gujarat. Mm. The states which are uh, associated with the, with the higher amount of investments, more manufacturing and industrial activity. These are the schemes, these are the states where PMKY does not do very well. But the fee-based business happens, especially in Maharashtra happens pretty well, you know. So I think uh, wherever, uh, you know, the, the existing base of industry is good, the, f the formal and, uh, uh, you know, organized play of industry is more I think things work very well for uh, fee-based uh, training. Okay. The the other question which Anuj uh, uh, has discovered from the the committee report. We're coming back to the committee report because it's it's a it's a report set up by the government, and it is very critical of the 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 manner in which things have gone on so far. Now, one broader question. Of course, they they make many accusations which you don't may not agree with. Uh, but one question that arises, which uh, Anuj, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there is a sus suspicion of uh, the private sector as a partner. Correct. Right? Yes, yes. There's a constant, uh, uh, since this is a public-private partnership, NSGC. right? Inevitably. NSGC is, yeah. Yeah. So there is the, the government uh, committee uh, finding, uh, reports finding, uh, is that the private sector is not fulfilling its part of the obligation. Now, I don't understand what is this all about. Can you just throw some light on, on that? See, uh, you know, one can always argue is private sector or, or the industry doing uh, enough or not doing enough. But let's look at the entire genesis of uh, the job roles, you know. Like each of these sector skill councils, you know, it has, uh, you know, the governing council does not comprise of industry people. They may have one or two uh, so government people. It, largely, it has industry people, you know. Mm -hmm. For example, healthcare is headed by Dr. Naresh Trihan. Vandana Luthra helps her beauty and wellness, you know. Uh, Mr. Obroy, Vikram Obroy used to, uh, till recently, head our uh, hospitality, uh, hospitality uh, uh, sector skill council. Similarly, everywhere, you know, uh, 
uh, I think they're very, very iconic people. Uh, the the NASCOM uh, chairman uh, heads the uh, IT and ITS uh, IT councils. Okay. Mr. Ajit Gulabchand heads the construction. They're very iconic, and they're not just the chairman. The other people in the governing council are also, uh, you know, uh, who's who of the industry. And what they essentially do, they brainstorm, and then they decide that which are the job roles in their vertical, which will constitute a critical mass in terms of wage or self-employment opportunities. Mm -hmm. They do the occupation mapping. And then they develop detailed, uh, you know, uh, uh, national occupation standards based mm. on which the training happens. And qualification. These, packs, and qualification. Right? So qualification packs are nothing but another name for uh, job roles, actually. You know, and each qualification pack or job role will have multiple uh, 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 occupation standards. You know, mm. and these occupation standards essentially come from the industry, or, and they go through industry validation, not by just one or two players, by multiple players, not just the large industry, but the MSME sector also, small sector also, before they become the national standards you know kind of thing right, right. so i think industry is uh, chipping in you know uh, uh, you know but are they doing enough this is a debatable question uh, but but very clearly i mean uh, uh, skills is an area where for six decades we had a bare minimum Ooh. industry involvement in skills so i think uh, this journey started barely so, well, is what exactly yeah. does the report say about yeah, the there, private there, sector there two or three different points it makes so one as you know mr krishna has pointed out Clearly, the, our industry captains spend a lot of time in these sector uh, scale councils and so on and so forth. The one uh, thing it brings up is that the NSDC, while majority shareholding is held by industry associations, 100%, near 99% of funding comes from the government. That's right. So the industry associations, companies are not sort of putting their money where their interests really lie here. So they're not, their funds are not coming out, you know, and funding the SSCs and so on and so forth. So do you think this should change uh, in the years ahead? Should, it, should NSDC depend on purely 100% government funding? No, uh, NSDC could always raise funds for... Uh, or could um, private sector contribute more in terms of funding? Could, could, could contribute, but let's also look at... See, NSDC is not the only route through which corporate sector invests in skilling. You know, many yes. corporates have set up their own yeah, iconic uh, skill development centers. Yeah. They do skilling for their own employees. Look at the IT industry itself. It's a finishing you know, school. Absolutely. Uh, so, I think... Yeah. Uh, like Infosys so has its own finishing school. Absolutely. Every, every major IT company, uh, Infosys, TCS, Wipro, uh, you know, everybody has... Uh, uh, not just finishing, even technical schools and finishing schools, sure. both. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this uh, this this happens. And if you capture that data, the entire private sector play in the in the skill development space, the, the money that they contribute, uh, you know, which is not captured unfortunately in our country. It will not be second to the government at all. It, mm -hmm. They they spend a lot of money, you know. So they through multiple routes, private sector chips in. It, they may not do it necessarily through NSDC. Uh, well, if NSDC could raise, raise uh, money from sources other than the government, yes, it, it, it could, it can, and it should. But but uh, very, very very clearly, I think uh, it's not just a question of money being... Do you think NSDC could go to the market and raise money? And See, it's, kind it's of corporatize? A, it's a, it's a not-for-profit organization. So, so, so far... Why? why? I mean, why can't it be for-profit? I think by design, it was thought that... Uh, See, let's also look at uh, NSDC... So if you're not-for-profit, then you, you necessarily depend on... You know, donations from, well, the industry, which... Yeah, so so the, the training business that we promote, that is for profit. Mm. In the sense, all, all our training partners, whom we fund, or even they may be not fund, non-funded, they, they encourage them profit, uh, skilling for profit, you know, kind of thing. But we, we uh, you know, our founding fathers thought that the best form for NSDC is a not-for-profit uh, organization. And let's also understand why, see, uh, uh, you know, why was it set up as a as a, a PPP, you know, kind of a thing. Mm. Couldn't government has, have chipped in rest of the equity also? Uh, mm. could, could it not have done it? It could have done it very, very easily to keep it 100%. But uh, it, it was thought perhaps that, uh, you know, you'll need the work culture of private sector. You'll need the flexibility and operational freedom of a private sector. Mm. You'll need a uh, uh, lot of uh, velocity of decision making has to be faster. And, uh, you know, I think these were, and, and, and to, to sub, above all, to get the best of breed uh, people from the industry and elsewhere to, to, to get into these roles. I think so these, these benefits are far more than, uh, you know, uh, in creating an organization which has uh, a high degree of very, very good professional ethos, a good work culture, a very, very different responsive sensitivity mm -hmm. than, 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 you know, what generally people in the country associate it with government, you know. So I think those uh, uh, objectives have been realized to a large extent, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and they, the very clearly it was known that government funds would be leveraged, uh, uh, you know, and delivery will be through NSDC, which was uh, always thought to be a private sector company because of the benefits that I talked about. Correct, know. that's true. No, and so, I mean, um, another aspect, especially in terms of quality 
of skilling. So the sector skill councils for our viewers who might not know. So they create, as you said, NOSs and QPs. And so the, the, gov the government panel that was constituted, one of the uh, one thing that points out is that a lot of the national occupational standards that have been created are too broad. So for instance, I mean, they give a very nice example of, you know, if you want to skill a driver. And for instance, there are four different sector skill councils. We each have their own NOSs about, you know, what a driver needs to know, a chauffeur, a truck driver, and so on and so forth. And all of these are sort of overlapping, and yet they are still not comprehensive when you compare it to a country like Korea or Germany and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I know that you've said that this report has not been accepted by the government as of yet, and uh, uh, there uh, still might be a lot of back and forth and uh, in the way it pans out in the end, but they sort of, you know, explicitly state that this reason why our NOSs are not comprehensive enough is because there was a lot of, you know, private consultants who were brought in who perhaps didn't do, you know, the job that they were supposed to because this was, you know, based off monetary incentives and so on and so forth. So, I mean... See, see we, we, we have 1900 job roles and the same job role being in multiple uh, sector skill councils or made by uh, multiple sector skill councils, they're very, very rare, very few and far between such examples, you know. Mm. Uh, uh, but, you know, wherever, so to, 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 but there was, there, there was a situation that one SSC has made a job role, but that job role is demanded by other SSCs. So now we have started loaning of job roles. So any SSC could have made it, but any other SSC, as long as there is a business case, which is approved by NSDC, we allow them usage of uh, job roles, uh, 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 you know, uh, loaning of job roles to other SSCs, you know. And the entire compensation, assessment, uh, number uh, accumulation is allowed to the, to the SSC which has loaned that job role, you know, kind of thing. So all these things are getting done. Uh, but, um, you know, are, are there not too many, I mean, when you talk about the driver, I mean, uh, like, for example, uh, light commercial vehicle driver, it's not there in multiple SSCs, it is one, but the requirements of a driver in a light commercial vehicle versus a earth moving equipment, these requirements are very different, you know, even for that matter, light commercial vehicle and a, and a lorry driver, they're very different requirements, you know, kind of thing. So now it is very clear that any SSC can make it and any other SSC, uh, as long as the justification it. can adopt it and, and start using it. Yeah. You know, one bigger question, uh, Jen. You you just said that you you slowly you're moving to skilling, say two million, uh, you know, new uh, people a year, right? Uh, under uh, Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, the will be could be little more than that. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there'll be fee based also. And, and overall, if you if you add fee based everything, aggregate about three million. Uh, you know, everything put together uh, for NSDC itself, it yeah. will be about uh, uh, four million. Uh, in the coming financial year. You will be skilling 4 million people? Yeah, directly. And then there will be other Government of India programs, there will be other mm -hmm. corporate programs, there will be state government programs. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so, so what is the adequate number according to you? Uh, if, you, if, you if you look at the labor force uh, or the employable labor force uh, at 480 million, and if you, if you yourself said that currently formal skilling is received by less than 5%, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which makes it less than 24 million. Huh? So, so how, how will you scale this up to, to at least to say 100 million, 150 million? You'll have to do that, right? See, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge. You know, if you really ask us, you know, the country has, in the last policy in 2015 had embarked upon uh, a target to skill 400 million people by the year 2022. So, if we so is, isn't that a this four hundred million pe it's people? It's a daunting, by daunting target. Yeah, it, it uh, seems almost impossible, right? Uh, at, at the current pace of uh, uh, skilling that that's going on by you and others all combined. Yeah. Hmm? So yeah, so it's it's a, it's a huge task, you know. I mean, uh, if you uh, ask us whether we'll uh, be able to achieve that, I, no, nobody can answer that today. You know, a lot more galloping uh, of efforts is required. Uh, we really need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have more and more people come to us, take loans, set up. Create in, uh, uh, indus uh, investments in skilling. A lot of corporates have to come and, and you know they have to help. A lot of cap corporate skilling which already happens. That data also needs to be tracked and captured, uh, which is not happening today. Not you know. Happening, yeah. So so I think it's a big so, task. So currently you're saying that we are not even probably mapping as to how much how many people are getting skilled through multitude uh, through, through, through multiple efforts by government corporate sector everything yeah. Yeah? government every, uh, there is a mapping available yeah, okay. which uh, government of india which is the skills ministry as well as other government of india ministries and state governments that data is consolidated but corporate data is still not available uh, except in bits and pieces here and there yeah. uh, Jan, the, the, sorry the, the quality of skilling that happens in other ministries though has that come up to sort of a common standard you know i know there were some concerns over that 
over the last two years. So I mean, the every minister, 19 other ministries, I think, do some sort of vocational education, but they don't necessarily follow the NOS. Like and mi- ministries like what textiles and uh, textiles, what? Uh, okay. uh, H- MHRD does a lot of things, and uh, you know, but a lot of the common criticism from many of you know the civil society in the past has been that these vocational education are not training efforts are not sort of standardized they have not resulted in you know good quality so so is uh, nsdc sort of going to reach out to the other ministries in this regard and sort of come up with something that i, I think i think it's happening already uh, big time see for example if you look at uh, uh, the ministry of housing and urban poverty elevation they uh, run a scheme called hupa uh, the, the, sorry, uh, NULM, you know, HUPA is the name of the ministry. And similarly, uh, the Rural Development Ministry runs uh, the Deen Deyal Upadhyay Yojana, you know, kind of thing. So many of these courses are already aligned to the National Skills Qualification Framework okay. and the job roles map to the job roles which are there in the in the overall skills ecosystem. So I think it, it didn't, they didn't start from uh, there, but you know, I think that mapping and that, that uh, you know, that uh, alignment is, is, is happening. We also have common norms, you know, yeah. so even norms for compensating training partners who do uh, programs for various uh, government of india schemes and all that and other government schemes you know those are uh, those are getting aligned to the same standards you know and uh, largely it has been done you know kind of a thing Correct. so the, we didn't start with that but i think a lot of work has happened in the last year year and a half uh, to to bring uh, you know for this kind of an aggregation and alignment of various uh, government skilling uh, schemes uh, you know into uh, based on common norms you know. that's true and uh, you know what's also added uh, Mr. Krishna's burden is that you know the difference between the 2009 policy and the 2015 policy with regard to skilling is that the 2015 policy also adds the extra criteria that you have to place them at a certain wage, you know, a certain a, a livable wage. You know, uh, that how has that standard been met across different sectors and industries with regard to you know, okay, you skill them, you know, they do get placed, but the wages that they receive are they. You know. So you have to ensure a certain minimum wage, is it? Mm. See, see, we, we, we let, let's understand. I mean, every state government has minimum wages, right? Kind of a thing. Delhi uh, has 13,000 rupees, right, per month? No, just recently. Uh, no some levels it will be less than that also. I uh. think the unskilled level will be less than that. So I think uh, every st- it is a state subject. So every state comes out with three, four categories of uh, skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled workers. For yeah, mi- minimum wages, wages, yeah. Minimum wages, you know, kind of thing. But let's understand 91% of our jobs are in unorganized sector and in informal sector, you know. So I'm not saying nobody in this sector uh, uh, adheres to the minimum wages, but there are many who do not adhere to minimum wages. And for wages. that 91%, I think our research is abysmally poor. I don't think we have mapped that 91% no, so properly. Yeah, we have not mapped properly. I mean, there's there's some connect with that world, but not not uh, adequate. So I think that's, that's a big challenge. See, th- there's no other country in the world which has such a heavy composition of jobs in the informal and unorganized sector. You know, perhaps we are, we, you know, our, our rules, our labor laws uh, and a lot of other things, you know, which, which, which were, uh, which the industry found, uh, you know, uh, need uh, to be, uh, you know, require a lot of relaxation. And because of which, you know, workarounds were found and a lot of even some of the big corporates also resorted to contract manufacturing and, uh, you know, outsource manufacturing and so on and so forth. So I think that's very, very important because most of these jobs in an informal and unorganized sector are not aspirational. Students don't really look forward to them. So I think it's a challenge we as a country we need to we need to fight and minimum wages see you can the law can mandate the law can do as much end of the day market forces prevail you know you can you can walk the talk with respect to the industry you know when you engage with the industry that please give premium to skilled people over unskilled people but at the end of the day it's a demand and supply and the market forces take over you know so you so by regulation you can take go this far and not beyond you know and the big challenge in the informal sector Jayant, correct me if I'm wrong is also that mo- most of them are self-employed. Like 60, 50, 60 percent are self-employed. There, there is a fair uh, percentage yeah, and of and self-employed. This, this government also has focused on the self-employed. Yeah. You know, the Mudra Bank. The Mudra Bank really. Loans to the self-employed. Right. Yeah. And this whole Stand Up India uh, slogan that the Prime Minister has coined is uh, it's about uh, startups. About you know, the self-employed, yeah, right? right. So, yeah. In fact, I think I just saw a news report a couple of days ago. I think the Niti Aayog is now sort of embarking on sort of trying to get better data. And getting job data and all that. Yeah, it was there in today's newspaper. Today's newspaper, yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Great, I guess so. Thank you for joining us and uh, you know, please do look forward uh, to your work uh, in the coming years. And, and my only request to all of you is please evangelize the skills. It needs a lot of evangelization. Uh, every uh, media channel, everybody, every corporate house, every opinion leader has to walk the talk. You know, then only skills will become aspirational in the country. There are problems in the sector. We are all working hard to resolve these problems. But, but as I said, it's, it's a huge uh, and daunting task. 
and we every stakeholder in the nation needs to work together but, to but the best better. the best evangelization is people getting jobs so, and they'll talk about it absolutely and and of course when when they do that and they do, do get jobs we'll talk about it definitely absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, you. thank you thank you